Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from, from Outer, Outer Space. Space. Hope you enjoy. Story number one: Light Munitions, written by Steel Blue Eight. Zaiskaha steps off the sleek, bizarre craft onto the landing deck of the vast city. Claws clacking on the metal ground, and purple striped skin shining with iridescence in the orange-tinted light of the twin stars above. Two humans in clean white military suits with sleek guns at their hips behind, watching her every move. The first step is one straight into the history books, the first time a non-human so much as got within visual range, let alone set claw on the famous fortress world of forward command. And not only that, Zai Skarha is on a diplomatic mission, serving as an ambassador for the very force forward command stands against. For eight months, the conflict had been at a stalemate. Not a single ship of the Great Six Cities Alliance, making it past the clear line in the sand drawn by humanity. And at the forefront of the slime is a binary star system, where any craft is obliterated before so much as reaching the heliosphere. No mines, no projectiles detected, no communications, just carriers and cruisers and capital ships suddenly collapsing into debris. The ambassador steps forwards, and is met by a man in full military dress uniform, blue sheen to the black suit. He's tall by human standards, which puts him at solid foot below the towering lithe Daltian stepping forward, wrapping her mouth around the alien sounds of English with all the aptitude befitting of a diplomat. General Lopez, I appreciate you offering to permit me a tour of your military facilities. The older man nodded and extending a hand, which awkwardly hangs in the air with no reciprocation. Ambassador Zyskarha, we hope that the showcase of our installments will help in pursuing further peace talks with the Six Cities Alliance. Voice dripping with venom as he turns tail and leads them to a waiting rail car. Alien diplomats having to duck down to fit into a heavily guarded, heavily armored vehicle, silent tail following behind. Ford Command is a vast, extremely fortified installment. Less a city and more a singular machine, huge metal walls, layer upon layer of catwalks and railway tracks and conveyor belts, greys and whites and camouflage tan, every single square centimeter optimized for military production, a festering pockmark of munitions and highly trained soldiers. In short, it's nothing Zyskara hasn't seen before. And the Daltin were wholly unimpressed, making sure to tell the general as much, in diplomatic terms, of course. This installment is a wonder of engineering. We have one much similar on Skaldasif and uh, Kroll, though those are both larger. The last stop of the tour, however, is the real important part. Thinly veiled pleasantries sipping on expensive drinks from the respective whole worlds as the rail car hurtles towards the very core of the city, where, rising above the whole vast facility, is an absolutely gargantuan tower, bristling with obscenely vast artillery guns of some form, meter width four and hundreds long. The security is almost as obscene as the guns, though. Zyskaha is quick to privately note. None of it would serve as any counter to the bug she's been silently planting throughout. Sloppy on their behalf, though so far little she's seen was worth listening in on. She's not listening to the general in the elevator as he talks. Just forward command outpost, not a fully fledged. Busy puzzling in her head over the purpose of the visit. The elevator doors open into a control room. Ah, here. This is the real meat and potatoes of our little tour. Gesturing out through the white glass windows, looking down onto the vast open space, all sides bristling with mechanisms used to load the massive guns, engineers crawling all over the artillery crews on perpetual standby, filling most of the central space, vast tubular devices piles high, about a meter thick, fifteen long, with a rounded front and back, like an oversized cigar. Some of the panels popped open to reveal a complex mass of piping and coils inside. Piping and coils that, under closer inspection, Zyskaha recognizes as the internals of a light drive, albeit clearly a crude, cheap variant. So, oh, Ambassador, you've likely been wondering throughout this whole trip, how is it that you are the first Altian to so much as set eyes on this world? This here is how, he states, waving his hand broadly across the array. They're very crude, actually. A light drive up the front went worth down the spine, and the rest is just batteries. 
We point them at your ships and when our buoys fire off and just set them in motion, tiny jumps is the trick. She takes a moment to put things together, a look of shock on her reptilian, eyeless face as she puts it together, vanish back to the impassiveness in moments. Tiny, tiny jumps, about 15 meters in all likelihood, over and over again, because all projectile detonation relies on seeing it first. If it's traveling overall faster than the speed of light, though, you get carriers and cruisers and capital ships suddenly collapsing into debris because a 15-meter-long solid metal beam has materialized directly inside of them. An ingenious design is her only comment. Lopez, barely able to restrain a beam and having finally outmaneuvered the diplomat. However, I must ask, why would you clearly showcase and explain your secret weapon to the enemy it is used against? She asked, realization hitting her exactly as the words fell from her lips. Why did the general just as calmly explain humanity's secret weapon to her? Why the security was so lax? Why this was simply called forward command, despite rivaling the crown jewels of her own military? They played their hand, because they know that there's nothing the six cities can do about it, and no need for a poker face when you're holding all the aces. Naturally, the war drew to a mostly peaceful resolution at the bargaining table just a few months later. End of story. Story number two. Fight or Flight Aura Written by H.D.U. Fort The Hermane Xenobiologist scratched his head. He had not spoken for minutes, gazing at the screen in silence. Of course, the video recording had stopped playing for a long time, and all he could see was his own reflection in the blank screen. He looked wary, tired, and a bit older than yesterday. His assistant attempted to get his attention by ruffling her feather buds, but he shrugged and refused to turn his head. So, Professor Zar, I suppose we will have to rewrite parts of the research paper. We still have a few days before the conference. I'm sure the review board will understand. You have chosen one of the most complex xenopsychology subjects ever. Dwa, I can't. I, I just can't. It's too complex. I'm losing my mind, he sighed. We were the first to actually understand that humans are somehow different. Throughout the galaxies, among species and ecospheres, we see the same relationship patterns. The simplest passive life forms can either react to stimuli or not. The Deneb blue algae won't even secrete toxins when eaten. It's as if it was asking to be grazed. He paused. Tower continued stating their own familiar theory on duality in reaction to aggression, perhaps to lure the professor into a friendly intellectual match. Then amongst active life forms, there are predators who prey on the weak. Their victims will usually try to flee. That's the flight reflex. Some aggressive species will eat their own kin, their youngsters, because they're weak and cannot fight back. Flee, little slugs, or end up as snack. Some will use hypnosis techniques to frighten much bigger preys, which will also try to flee after soiling feather buds. The professor smiled ever so slightly at the image of a glumbo beast soiling itself. It was a gentle giant, a magnificent behemoth equipped with large claws to rip through dried mud. And still, its biology condemned it through the flight reflex. He just couldn't manage to fight back. It was wired that way. Professor, I think our article really shines when it comes to the fight reflex. Many predator species, except maybe their immature ones, more when severely injured, will have what you call the classical choice. They can turn around and fight, or they can flee. Flight. She continued, exposing the crux of the subject, or so they thought it was. And yet, only one species in the known to be wired to express both responses equally at any age, in any situation, and in a highly unpredictable way, which makes them so hard to evaluate militarily, so lethal. They have embedded this duality, even into their own grand military tactics. Humans. But still, we've only ever identified the classical fight-or-flight duality, even in them, so our article is still solid. The professor mumbled, Yeah, the aesthetics of dualities. Things that are either black or white, sides of a coin, light and shadows, flight or fight. Such a seductive illusion. He sighed again, then continued. Shattered by the mere existence of humanity. How many more sides can a coin have? He lamented. They rewatched the one hour long video. They recorded hundreds of encounters taken from various human archives. Recordings of social flights, very physical courting, wars, street battles, random attacks and dark alley. Kids fighting for a toy, using all sorts of surprising tactics. Unarmed prisoners turning on their torturers, jailbreaks. Humans hunting humans, as if they were beasts. 
humans doing the unspeakable things and yet surviving, fighting, retreating, only to come back and kill. They saw so many situations, so many confusing responses, and tried to categorize them. They barely slept for the rest of the week. When they submitted their research paper, it caused such a scandal that the Xenobiology Conference had to be postponed. The title, Human Responses to Aggression, Fight, Flight, Faint, Fumble, Freeze, Flirt, Fart, Fool Around, or Feck. End of story. I would quickly like to thank the T5 channel members and Patreons. Caspar Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Lord Azrakal, It's Difficult to Pronounce, Dragzoon, WRE, Holly's Sister, Arcadian. Thank you very much.